for our meeting. Now, is Secretary Brian on? Who? Secretary Brian. Secretary Brian. Of Africa and Africa worldwide. Some someone was talking about that stuff. Um, the organization is ADEI, it's African Diaspora Development Institute, created by former ambassador Sihan Bori, Ericana Sihan Bori Kwai. And when I meet people, I tell them, I'm 79 years old, so I've been here for a while, but I tell them that Dr. Errol Connor is the most consequential black leader since Martin Luther King. And I was in school during the days of Martin Luther King. And so I've seen a lot of people since this time, but what Dr. Errol Connor is doing is organized, helping us to organize Africa for economic liberation. Africa is the third largest population group in the world behind China and India. It has a population of over 1.3 billion people. And then with the Africans in the diaspora, uh, the population of Africa worldwide are somewhere between 1.5 or 1.7. Okay, so I'm going to stop it again. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have anything else that I need to offer. I'll take a question or two if there are any. I, I think that the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group did a sponsor one of our meetings, I'll be the presenter and, and, and see if we can get North Carolina in the leadership. What, what, what we are asking, what we're doing in North Carolina, we're asking all black chambers of commerce nationwide to join the effort for the economic liberation of Africa. Of course, that will be powerful for our community, powerful Children, and it's the kind of stuff I think that every black person in the world has a moral obligation to help do something to improve the lives of Africans in the motherland. And so, with that being said, I'll get a question or two if they are, and if it's not, so I'll sit back and I'll listen to them. Now, North Carolina, North Carolina Civic Group is on the move and urge other people to follow up. And Ms. Sampson, I see your hand, so if you're ready, I'm ready. Okay, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, what do you say ADD stands for? ADEI is the African Diaspora Development Institute. And uh, what, what, what we what we're doing is reuniting with the African Union, which is the General Assembly for 55 African countries. They're divided into five regions, and Africans outside of the motherland are coming together under ADCI, and we will be these six regions, and we have membership in the African Union. Uh, I'll share some information with West Wing, and um, You'll do a profile and try to provide a lot more information. <laughs> but I will uh, be here tomorrow at 3 o'clock. And, and you're welcome. I urge you to stand if you can. Uh, yes, yeah, you know, when you had sent the link, but I didn't receive it, you know, it put me in chat. You know, can you uh, tell me what it is so I can write it down so I can make sure? I'll take it to begin. Because the link is too long. For me to say, can you see now? Well, it's not coming to my screen, so that's why I know. I don't know how to get to you. 
from Medicaid that just covers family planning to Medicaid that will be full health care coverage. And so for half of the people in this group, we already have a relationship with them, and they will, in some sense, automatically be moved from a partial Medicaid coverage to a full Medicaid coverage. So that's half of the 600,000. A uh, hundred thousand of the of our potential new members would are subject to losing Medicaid coverage because of the loss of the COVID extensions on Medicaid. During COVID, we extended people's eligibility on Medicaid because we didn't want to knock people off from health coverage in the middle of a pandemic. But they will now be uh, now all of those people. Uh, will have to be recertified. And so it is our hope that we will have uh, Medicaid expansion operate in time. Okay, okay, you straighten me up, Secretary. Okay. Um, so for 100,000 of those beneficiaries, uh, they are people who are on Medicaid, uh, have been on Medicaid, and we will hopefully do a recertification process with expansion. They will now continue to be eligible now that um, they are, uh, we have expanded coverage because they need to, be, to now be over $5,000 or some other uh, or something, and now hopefully they will be covered in uh, expansion, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The other bucket would be 200,000 uh, potential folks who aren't currently enrolled in <coughs> at all and would be in a, a group of members who would be eligible uh, for Medicaid. Um, so what is this Medicaid expansion population? It is adults age 19 to 64 with income up to 138% of the federal poverty level. So what does that mean? It's still low income in that it is adult, single adults who have income of approximately $20,000 each year. And parents who, for example, in a family of three, could have an income up to 34000 Prior to expansion, that cutoff was 8000 So you can see how low that was. So it should help uh, some lower wealth families. Uh, you get care, health care the same way you do on the existing Medicaid program. You get the same comprehensive benefits and co-pays as other non-disabled adults in Medicaid. And we are working together with our external stakeholders to drive the implementation of Medicaid. Uh, now, Ms. Betty Selby has, is one of our external implementation partners. And Betty, you need to make sure you are attending these Medicaid um, expansion meetings or that you, if you can't attend, you get that you work on getting a representative. So let me know if you're having any problem with getting the notices or attending the meetings or want to uh, substitute someone. But the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group can be and need to be represented in this process of us uh, uh, because we're looking at access, we're looking at communication, we're looking at of, you know, how we, a data and monitoring strategy, um, uh, and uh, and we're looking at enrollment processing. So we surely need your input on how on making this as community um, friendly as possible. So who is covered under med, under Medicaid expansion? Low-income parents, as I just described, uh, with income less than 34000 for a family of three. Low-income child units adult with income of less than $20,000 per year. So this would be low-wage workers in agriculture, maybe child care, maybe construction. Some of you all would know better than I. Uh, 
who some of these folks might be in your community. Some veterans and their families would be eligible. Children who aged out of Medicaid, so young people who aged out of Medicaid, uh, if children could now be eligible as low-income adults. And women who would otherwise be covered if they got pregnant, but now they will be covered without being pregnant. So that is that uh, family planning uh, category I was talking to you about. So what does um, Medicaid cover? Just for those people who aren't as familiar, to bring to your attention, it covers primary care. And that is the major service we want people to get under Medicaid. We want everybody to have a primary care home. Inpatient and outpatient hospital services, vision and hearing services, prescription drug benefits, behavioral health services, including substance use disorder services, uh, preventive and wellness services, devices and other therapies, and of course maternity and postpartum care. Um, I already talked to you about uh, uh, Medicaid expansion um, uh, being a, a part of helping to cover people doing COVID or enrolled in Medicaid and remaining old because uh, during COVID, they, the federal government covered that coverage, that, that service, and is now uh, ending. And that uh, continuous enrollment period ended March 31st. Beginning in April, people were beginning to be recertified to determine if they are still eligible. Uh, and, and that recertification process will be, is a rolling process that will last for a year. So we are hoping that people who are currently enrolled in Medicaid uh, can, can continue to be covered under expansion. We're recommending that everyone currently enrolled in Medicaid update your contact information to make sure you're getting any new information about what is needed um, uh, with Medicaid expansion. So when will it happen? That's the big question everybody asks us. So of course, the said to enact, enactment of the state budget, that's when the budget becomes law. It's either signed by the governor, or he vetoes it and the veto is overridden, or he lets it become law without signing it. We then have to get approval of the uh, expansion uh, Medicaid program from the federal government. That will take a certain amount of time. And then we have to get our uh, IT and financial systems ready uh, to uh, make the necessary changes to enroll these, to change over and enroll these 600,000 people you heard me describe. And we are now, we are doing everything we can in advance to get ready for that. But in all, even with all of that, we think it will be probably the fall of the year before we are ready to enroll that first new person who is now on Medicaid. Now be aware that half of the will be already in our system and will be enrolled on a computer-based process, pretty much. So, um, the only other thing I uh, also remind you is there are uh, three ways you can get enrolled in Medicaid. There is an online process called EPASS. Uh, where you can go online and, and apply, but you can't apply for expansion now, but I'm saying currently on Medicaid. You can fill out a paper application and mail it in, or you can apply at the local DSS office. Those are currently the three ways you can enroll. Once expansion starts, you probably will be expanding locations uh, for enrollment, like libraries and perhaps some community-based locations. And we will, that's where we will need your help uh, advising us on, um, you know, what can best be done in your community to make Medicaid expansion work. So I want to stop here and answer any questions, see if there are any questions. I hope you were able to hear me okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and we, we were able to hear you okay. Um, Hey, Perry Brown, this is, this is Sears. Um, one, one, one of the, this is not a question, but it's just an observation that I make. Uh, uh, after all these years of waiting for Medicaid expansion, the Republic
Republicans finally chimed in and joined in on this. But I hope that there was, and, and, and help me out with this, is that the reason that they tied it to the budget so that they would still have control over the whole situation and that the governor would still be at that back and call because obviously if there is no budget, <laughs> there is no expansion. And in, the, in, and in addition to that, uh, <coughs> If they don't like it, they can still override his, his veto if he vetoes it. So, I mean, they've still got him in a box. That's correct. And so they are, it's all about political control. And uh, they are forced, uh, basically putting him and the, not only him, but the other Democrats and some of the Republicans who really want, uh, they've always been Republicans in favor of Medicaid expansion. It was just, you know, getting the leadership to agree on it. Uh, so it is basically keeping everybody in check uh, with these things that they will put in the budget that they know we would otherwise oppose and keeping you and all of us in check because if we go up there in opposition to the budget, then we are opposing Medicaid expansion in effect. <laughs> So it's a, it's a way to politically control all of us. They're, it's, it's, they're making us put everything on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, put everything, they're making us put everything on the line and take everything they put on the line for us to take in order to get this Medicaid expansion. That's really what it's boiling down to. We're having to hope that uh, it won't be something on the line that we just absolutely can't swallow. So that's what we have to hope. And meanwhile, people, we could, you know, people's lives, people are losing their lives every day. Um, but, and we want to be careful not that we, if, if you notice, you don't hear uh, many of us talking that much about it because we don't want to make politicize it even. So I, I hope this is all in the family. I don't want to be repeated on this. But so we are attempting not to politicize it any further because we don't want to make anything worse than it already is, than it already could be problem number one. So we're just sitting tight at this point, hoping for the best. We can wait for that day. Secretary Bryant, I, I do see where the Eastern Civic Group could. Did somebody ask me? I can't hear what. I'm, I'm just, I'm, in listening to your presentation, I do see where the civic group could be helpful in spreading the word. My my yeah. great, my greatest fear is that this this happens and our people are not aware that there is assistance out there for them. I was talking to some young people the other day about a newsworthy item concern, and they hadn't heard it. So they're not watching the news. Uh, well, 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 that's why we have an ex, 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 external implementation, implementation partner work group. As I mentioned to you, Betty Selby is on that group, so you all, and we will be getting out uh, communication toolkit. We can get, we will get speak. If you have uh, events and you want speakers, just let me know. We'll have. Um, other kind of materials that will be available. We're working and we want, we're trying to time everything because we don't want people in undating, you know, uh, calling up social services and it hasn't started yet because they already got enough to do with the people that are already on Medicaid and recertifying them and, you know, everything else they're trying to do to get ready. So the problem, so we are working to line everything up to get people understanding what's happening. Uh, and then, and then on, on launch day, we want to be ready to go uh, with information. Now, there is some of the information I'm now describing to you, we can get to you preliminarily for you to get out to your community group. Everybody just needs to know they can't go a block away. Yes. And so they have to wait for that day, if that makes sense. But this is what we're spending the next several months doing, is trying to make sure that under every rock where there are people in this target population that you heard me describe, individuals making $20,000 or less, families making $34,000 or less, 
that we can, 19 to 64, that everybody knows that it's something you need to look into to determine if you're eligible. Um, and that this is health insurance coverage, like any other health insurance. High uh, quality health insurance coverage. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, somebody want to say something? Well, what I wanted to say to the board, uh, then you tell me, is that maybe I will um, send in the email to Stan uh, that webinar, that group discussion that we had. Maybe I'll send, send it to the board or anybody else. Now, that would be great. Mr. President? Yes. That's great. That's great. And Becky, it seems like we lean on you for so many things. And this is just another thing that we're leaning on you with. You know, it takes a woman to run y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely counted on Betty for this. So, Betty, we need you to hang in there one more time through Medicaid expansion. Then we'll let you take a break. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. If, if there any other questions for me on Medicaid expansion, do you think you don't understand? Mr. President, I don't have a question. Uh, I'm about to say Senator Bryant, um, mm -hmm. uh, but how y'all reaching out to uh, social media and to organizations like the NAACP and places because these folk got uh, a following. So how y'all doing that? Uh, right. And it's uh, sororities, fraternities, uh, any organization that got especially an email list and. Um, Democratic Party, um, you know, I, 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 um, mm -hmm. I'm the first license in, you know, Edgecombe County and I send out information all the time. So we need to make sure that folk get this information where it can be sent out. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, we will. I, I, I have a slide deck of, of, of these five slides I can get to you, Camilla, so you'll have it uh, for your, uh, social media and uh, information but we will have a toolkit, a information toolkit that will have uh, all kind of media messages, social media, PSA, flyers, the whole nine yards. Uh, we are um, uh, uh, um, hoping we don't want to do anything until the budget passes because we don't want to create confusion if we end up in some kind of, you know, stuff, you know, we end up in a problem. So we're not launching anything other than, like I'm talking, you know, we are individually talking to groups and that kind of thing, and, and meeting with partners, of which all of the NAACP is one, for example. Um, but we are not going to launch the, the full blast toolkit until the budget passes. Because then we can say what the date, what the time frame is, and then it will be officially in law and in our hands. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, so we're trying to be careful and not create a political problem for ourselves or the legislature or whatever, or any confusion in the community. And we don't want our local, and most importantly, we don't want our local CSS to be inundated with people that they can't help. And therefore, they can't get to the people that they can. So we all can mindful of what this is going to mean for them. They're trying to staff up and ramp up in order to manage this. So there might be some opportunities for local jobs. I don't, they may well, I don't know if they'll be temporary or not, but there might be some opportunities for local jobs related to this. So you might just want to check with your, you know, just be, be mindful of those opportunities. <laughs> Any other questions for Secretary Bryant? And I had one other comment once it's after it, there are no other questions. Well, Ben, 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 if you can, could, yes, you, could you mute everyone except Secretary Bryant? Okay, yeah. Okay, the other, the other thing I wanted to mention to you all is, uh, Betty has mentioned to me a couple of meetings ago some interest in more information about uh, substance use disorder and in particular the fentanyl epidemic. Uh, and we have a now we have a state op opioid uh, director in place. Back at the time we were just hiring 
of filling that position. We now have a state opioid director in place, and she would like to join you in your one of your next couple of meetings. I don't know if what your summer schedule is, if you'll be meeting in July and August. Do you all have meetings then, or are you taking off until the fall? But she would like to be on one of your next agendas to answer questions about fentanyl and talk about uh, what the state is doing to address uh, substance use disorder epidemic. Will, will you give her, us the uh, contact information for her, or you will just let her go on our behalf? I will do. Okay, I will put, give that information to Betty, and you all, and you and, and uh, Wesley, and you all follow up with her. She's willing. She's interested in coming and talking with you, and might even come in person, depending on you know where it is and when the time is. But she will definitely join you virtually. I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, that's my report for this month. Thank you. Did you all like to give Sarah information? And thank you all for having me. Everybody have a great summer. You too. You too. Uh, Mr. President, is Mr. Greer still on? All right. Mr. Greer, I tag you in my live. If you would, go in the chat and post that link you were talking about earlier, if you would. Mr. Greer, unmute yourself. Why is it Miss Selby can Selby can post it in my chat? The link. And to Secretary Bryan and to all, we will be meeting in July. So we will look forward to seeing all of you in July. Next on the agenda, I'm going to ask Mr. Sears if he would uh, present our next speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't see, but I, I hope we have uh, Ms. Uh, Lamisha Whittington on. Yes, hello, good morning, good morning, I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, we, many of you, I hope, remember uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Whittington from uh, the uh, Advanced Carolina and the Black Alliance, and she was uh, uh, an integral part with them, and she has uh, <laughs> exceeded to come on to our discussion this morning just to introduce herself again to you. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're, we're so glad to have you. Go right ahead. Okay, before we're I can introduce myself, I'm working up a little bit on my end, so I'm going to jump in prematurely, so I just see them. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to ask the news, let me know if you can't hear me again. Uh, the news to Whittington, everyone knows me in LA. And as Leader Sears mentioned, I had the honor of serving as the deputy director for over three years at North Carolina Black Alliance in Bank of Carolina, and have since created my own corporation called the WISC Group. And we're a very national organization, but we focus on North Carolina as the foundation for all of our work. We met on a native North Carolina, and so I work with nonprofits. Um, as a fund advisor and a foundation advisor, I work with many of the foundations that um, specifically give grant funding to organizations like North Carolina Black Alliance. So I do a lot of coordination and support of communities like ours across the state uh, to support good leaders, great leaders, but to a civic group, uh, being able to recommend folks for grants, funding support, and also doing a lot of that environmental justice survey work. So right now I'm leading a 10 stop tour in southeastern North Carolina help the folks connect to the state and county governments to be able to access IRA funds, EJA funds, and ARPA funds. I was able to support a community in Sanchez County last year receiving $13 million for the first time to connect water 
uh, for the first time in the history of their community, and this is a predominantly black community in the town of Idaho. So that's just some of the work that we do in addition to providing research support, um, talking around soul and renewable legislative priorities. And I do want to drop in the chat that we really are asking folks to attend either hybrid or all in person next Saturday. The governor's office is convening a conversation for environmental justice priorities. And we can't speak too much about it, but our goal is we are currently um, expecting an executive order from Governor Cooper. But before that executive order goes live, uh, the office has made the commitment to getting, you know, just recommendations from communities of what should be reflected in that EO. Um, so if folks can attend, please register with a hybrid online. And something that I do implore is that in attendance, we are asking to prioritize. There should be some funding uh, commitment in the language of the executive order, not just enshrining environmental justice. We know that work, we know that work in perfect Eastern North Carolina. We need a stronger commitment from the state to commit to giving all these resources directly to our people in the contract language of the executive order. So that this prepares us for 2024. The reality is the elections are coming. And we have to be as frank about that, but what we do need to do is have a strong commitment from the folks who are in office presently that are in alignment, at least with our values, committing in contractual language of commitment to earmark all of this opening that North Carolina has received. And if we don't do that now, whoever we hope gets in office is on our body to continue the good work. But in the event that it is not someone in office that is in alignment with our values, they will use that money perversely in opposition to the needs of our community, in opposition to how funding was allocated to us. And if we get this language in contract, then they can't do it. They can't do it. They can't do it. And so, and I, I feel like somebody's off mute, so I'm going to drop that link in the chat, but I want to introduce myself, and this is great we'll be back in the space, but I hope to see folks uh, next Saturday. I'll be in Charlotte, but either way, online as well. But thank you, Leader Sears, and thank you so much, Senator, for having me. Thank you so much. Any, any, any questions or questions for Mr. Flair? What time does that mean? Next Saturday? It is. And let me, I, I was about to drop the, um, the check. It's an event right to the Let me do that next piece of time. Um, because it'll be half, um, at kind of a half day workshop in Charlotte. Um, please register as soon as you can. But let me get you the exact time. And I'll drop it in the chat. Okay, so I just dropped it in the chat, so you'll see that now. And then the time um, will be from 12.30 to 3 p.m. in Charlotte. Two hours and 30 minutes is the direction of the meeting. At 12.30 is the start time. And we are also, my group is also partnering with um, an organization called Democracy Green and another organization called RTI. RTI has currently received a large amount of funding from the EPA, and so I'm working with them to do water and air quality testing in communities. So we are going through churches right now who have partnered with us to help them test for lead and PFAS and other chemicals, not only to make folks aware that lead is in everybody's water, but also there's funding the state has received and subsequently county governments have received to replace all lead service lines. And if they're not replacing them, they are misusing or misappropriating the money. And so because they received money for those replacements, if your home was built before 1986, you have a high over 98% probability of having lead in your pipes. If you have a new home that you did not replace the pipes or the service lines were not replaced, the home can be new, but the pipes or the, the, the structures that hold the pipes together, they can also be lead contaminated. So that's also ongoing that we're doing in person, actual community workshops have been in Brunswick County uh, 10, 15 times, two times this week in Wilmington, and I need to connect Leader Greer, because we're doing, we're going across Columbus County, or we're willing to travel, and that's something else that we're doing for free to communities is paying for those lead testing kits at $100 per kit. They're free for community, thanks to Mark Green, but we're leading those workshops too, so folks can get those service lines and also pop more grant funding because there's grant funding from DEQ at the state level and county level all the way through 2026, and we need to access that money because it's there for us, and they will spend it if you do not show up with that request. 
and I'll stop there. <laughs> thank, thank you, L.A. Uh, uh, and if you could just keep us uh, apprised of whatever kinds of changes or things that we might do to, to further your efforts, hey, we'd be glad to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we have some people online. Oh, no, okay. uh, Betty, did you want me to do that? Um, I, I was just going to ask, um, before LA get off, when this grant money rolls out, um, who, who notifies, who notifies, is that our county commission? Uh, who's notified in our county? There's a post, so the county commissioners um, currently, as we recall the ARCA funds, when those rolled out you know, 2021 to 2022, there was supposed to have already been a commitment by receiving those funds, it depends on the county, but the commitment was to spend it on water infrastructure and then creating priorities for the rest of the money. And that means like economic rebuilding in the wake of COVID-19, this funding was supposed to, again, not just revitalize socioeconomics in the local area, it was also supposed to be for reservation and mitigation of infrastructure that had been contaminated and old for years. So that funding was already given to county commissioners in 2021 and that contractual language. So that was one book of money that was already made aware of county commissioners so they could apply for funding. Some folks could apply for funding with no limitations. That's mean they would receive the full amount they requested. There was no limit on what they could request. For example, Brunswick County County Commissioners received over $17 million to use for that. But it was already in hand. They received the first disbursement in 2021, the second in 2022, and they haven't even committed all of their funds. They just have to legally commit what they're spending those funds on by 2024. So communities are not, and guess what? Those county commissioners, not specific on Brunswick, that's where we are, to give them that use as an example, because every county should have applied and received funds. So I'm using Brunswick, you can look online on your county government website, and they already have notices there, whether it's very, um, they've already had notices of how much money they received. I know I was working with Northampton County, um, and some community groups that through there, and Halifax, we were able to pull documents to show that they had already received money. So the reality is, though, even though they received it, they haven't necessarily announced it to community. That's where I come in, that's where my group comes in, is that we're doing the actual footwork of going to community, to community, to figure like association groups, um, a Baptist association, access to what we're getting in, and we're saying, hey, they didn't tell you, we have to carry the labor as us to carry that to our people. And that's what I'm engulfed in right now, because their announcement to the community has been limited to just a government county website and saying, hey, show up. But that was back in 2021 and 2022. But if folks can get in, community members engage with county commissioners and your county managers. So that's the thing. Your county managers, as you all are already aware of this, but I just like to remind folks, they can put plans in front of the county commissioners, and sometimes county commissioners will just trust the manager and just vote it even without reading it, even without going through it. So we have to have a relationship with the county manager and they can build in plans to get those service lines in place, water filtration system, get in community hooked up for water that's filtered, and that's just some of the stuff. Economic development, small business support, I was using the environment as an example, because that's what I'm working on right now, but they can help you devise plans if you come with the idea of what your community needs, and then they place it from the county commissioner, and they can vote it in as a plan, and then they'll earmark some of that money. From the ARPA, I rent each of buckets to your actual community development. You have to get that in before 2024. <coughs> I have a question. Um, you said that each, how can we find out which, how much money each county got? Is, is there a link that we can go to and look at? That's, that's right. It's your county government website. Um, and so if you don't see it, I'll drop my email address in the chat. Just shoot me an email and my team can pull up the documents and send it to you if you don't see it. It should be on your county government website. So go there first. Or and here's the other thing. They've also some counties actually place notices in the newspaper in the actual for sale section. 
And how egregious, like they actually placed it not in the front page, not in the notices, they placed it in a very, uh, very you know, specific area. So even if some of your newspapers, there should have been alerts that were published between 2021 and 2022, but they may be in very odd places in the newspaper. But go to your county government website, I'll drop my email in the chat, and if y'all see it, let me know and we can pull back. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Um, my, my concern is, is not necessarily how much they got, but how they allotted. How can we check on how they have allotted those funds? Yes, sir. And so what we've seen so far is it's still on the same county government website. So what they've done is when they have, um, I'll use Brunswick again as an example, the same thing happened in New Hanover, but what Brunswick did is they used a county government website to first make the announcement of how much they received. They then during some of their county commissioner meetings, they had a presentation and they saved that PowerPoint from that meeting to the county government website. And in that PowerPoint was the delineation of the buckets of what they earmarked or you have committed the funding to go to one area. And they already have that up. They also have a, for example, they'll have a, in Brunswick County, they have a commitment to water infrastructure and environmental quality. They have jobs, COVID-19, you know, in uh, uh, socioeconomic support. They have education, and as one of the buckets, they also have uh, a, a statement in that notice that there's still a certain amount of odd millions of dollars left to be earmarked, and they have to again, earmark the dollars by 2024. So even if your county doesn't have all of the money designated or spent, so to speak, um, they will mention that on the county government website, but look for the minutes from previous county commissioner meetings and then look for PowerPoints is what we found is that they're sometimes hidden within those attachments on county government websites other than ARPA, IRA, EJA, or anything that's just COVID-19, um, you know, just, just, pandemic support, like those are some of the keywords, but it should still be on the county government website and they'll have those buckets earmarked and they'll tell you how much money is still left earmarked. Should they have had a hearing of how those monies would be dispersed? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Should, should the county government have had a public hearing before deciding how to allot those funds? Um, yes, sir. So essentially, it depends on each county. That's why I kind of call saying yes. So what we've noticed is a trend. If some county commissioners did post on their website that they were having public hearings, and we've seen where they'll have between one and three public meetings, and they had it between 2021 and 2022, and the only place they did notices that we saw was on their website. So if you wasn't catching up to their county government website or looking in again for sales sections or weird sections in the newspaper, it was hidden. And so a lot of folks missed those meetings because a lot of them already have had public meetings um, between the 21 and 22 area. But the thing I do want to say is that there is still more funding coming. So there will still be more public outreach meetings, not just on part of that. They've already happened. You still need to engage with them because they still have to earmark and spend that money. That's still ongoing. But there are, there's funding, again, coming to NCDEQ in December for $96 million to you help know, with flooding mitigation. That's a separate bucket of money. They are still trying to work out how they're going to get grants. They're going to do it in organization, which they should. Uh, that's my opinion, but that's also our recommendation because I'm appointed, I'm a governor appointee to two boards, L Water, and so there's money coming in December for flooding. That's happening, so we want to go ahead and elevate that here. And that's NCDEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, Blueprint Flooding Resiliency Plan. Long word, but they're supposed to be going across the state and working in different watersheds to help reduce and mitigate the flooding that's happening on the east, of course, every season, right? Whether it's something or this time and that. So that's it for funding. There's going to be community outreach meetings based around that funding. But that's the state level. Look at their website. The county government can still apply for funding from justice. 40 specific grants. Most of them are not doing that. There's funding that is available from the EPA around environmental justice. So there's different buckets of money that is available, not just one. And I am supporting and advocating for all of you know community leaders, organizations to engage around several buckets of funding, not just one, because that's the whole purpose. Like if there's a need to apply, 
And the last thing I'll say to answer that question is that there is also funding that is earmarked by the state and federal government that your local elected officials have to actually prove that they're partnering with organizations in order to even receive funding. Like some things have changed with certain monies that they can't just come in and apply and then promise they'll give it to groups. They now have to have a letter of commitment from the actual organizations themselves with the county commissioner or local elected leaders to prove that they're diligently partnering. That's changed. That's them trying to be like the EPA, trying to create more equity in applications. But because it's happening, there's leverage for local leaders, county leaders, to meet with county commissioners and say, I have projects that we need to address. We have flooding. We have old water pipes. We need water filtration systems. We need clean air. We need air filters. Whatever that project may be, you can go to them with the plan, go to them with how many people are impacted, and then do a joint proposal if you so choose with the county and that can actually get them money that they would have already received. Now, given different levels of information, I hope it's not confusing. It's just a lot of money that is moving at the same time because the impact of contamination is impacting every community, not just black and brown folks right now. That's why there's so much money coming to the state, not just for COVID-19 relief, but because there's contamination that is very grandiose for every community, which is a rare opportunity for us to be able to pass a bill to fund the explosion of four 42-hour communities before it's available now. Unfortunately, we just have to know what state departments, what county departments to go to, how to apply for those grants, what those folks need. Assistance, we are working on, if you feel like you need a grant writer, technical assistance, we have relationships where we can help try to connect or advocate for those technical assistance supports. So that's some other things that have been hindering folks from applying, but just want to notice, given those out there, that is a hindrance, please let me know. I'll drop the note again in the chat. And again, if there's any other questions, I'll be here to answer, but thanks again for having me. Thank you so much. This has been so informative to me. And, and I, I'm looking at the faces when, when I'm looking at the faces in front of me when you were going over there and all of us seemed amazed and it's not like we're not active in our communities we are but uh, we didn't know that and, and I will just speak of a personal experience I did go to our county manager and ask about some of the funding from the the art and the infrastructure money. And they had already allotted how they were going to spend it. And I, I had the guidelines in front of me, and the guidelines say that you have community meetings. And I asked them had they had a community meeting. And the answer was no. But most of the money had been allotted. So so this, this is so helpful, and I, I thank you for that. Absolutely. And what I will say to add that, because you're so right, and I appreciate your personal testimony, because we've noticed our folks was in a lot of times was misused. A lot of folks are using mm -hmm. furniture, uh, retroactively paying folks uh salary, mm -hmm. redoing buildings, right? And so now state and federal government is having to come down on them harder to restrict them from misusing funds. Like this is what's happened because they haven't received this much money before. So you have folks who aren't used to receiving a, a, a large amount of money. They're like, well, hey, let's just spend on what we can want to spend on and not actually be equitable. Like there's all these things that are happening. And something I always tell um, leaders that I've been faced with is when, you, when you're when you advocating on record, just as you did to say, hey, did you actually have these community meetings? They have to report testimony Legally, because it's codified into the it's codified it's legal record. And if you're not on legal record at these meetings saying that they did wrong, then when they do get petitioned or sued or come under trouble by the state and federal government, if you didn't get on legal record, then they look like they've done right. So it's interesting that most times they don't tell us that when we go to these county commissioner meetings or we put our voice on official record, they tell us to expect change immediately in that meeting, and then when we don't see it, sometimes it can be disparaging. But what they don't tell us is that that testimony you gave is now legally in trial as an actual proof. 
of what they are doing and what they aren't doing. And then if you do decide to do legal action or sue or come to it's a long marathon, I can't get a lot of that testimony is legal. Um, mm -hmm. is legally documented and the actual files for the heifer report because they don't fund it. So I do just want to add that of what she did. Um, it's a big deal. Now, we need to be that if, if, if you're not speaking, we do ask that you mute your mic. Okay. And Ms. Betty, I just hear your question. I'm signing up to your hand as well. And, and Ms. Betty, can we ask for an audit of these, these monies? I would love, and I lean on y'all's expertise as being elected officials and appointed officials from the point of the state. I can find out that question. I'll write it down. I, you know, I want to be careful that I'm not saying yes, yes, the audit. I, but my thing is, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to call to carpet those questions, and that's why being on legal record, giving your testimony, engaging with them, even contacting the county manager as soon as next week, whoever your county manager is, and asking and sitting down and saying, hey, these are the projects that we need, the needs that we need, show me where we can fit in, when's going to be the next round of grants, and can you put that proposal from the county commissioners, creating that relationship with the county manager, is a pathway to that next conversation for audit if it's not satisfying. So I'll ask that question, and if I find out an answer, I'll get it back. I'll get it back to you. And then I know I saw Simon um, also had a hand raised. Hello, everybody. Um, Simon, once again, Black Voters Matter. Here in Pitt County, we're representing Black Voters Matter in Mosa. So we're a bachelor region organization. And so I just wanted to ask really quickly, um, uh, 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 Lamisha, um, I have someone here from Pinkwood Passion, which is based in Warren County, and they work with folks that have um, that experience with cancer. Um, I wanted to know if you could tell me briefly what are some of the symptoms of folks that might have um, been exposed to that poison? If you could tell me. Yeah, that's very helpful. And we do, that kind of, I'll give a very brief like answer of just quick things, but you know, presentation that I've partnered with, I've partnered with, I mentioned them already, Democracy Green, and their environmental justice democracy board that has been doing this work for about five or six plus years. And like North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, they're one of the two um, older EJ boards in the state. And so I work with them and they actually provide a very comprehensive led workshop. So I do want to give them a shout out and I'll place the, the email address of the executive director in the chat. Because I, and while I'll answer that question, if you want a comprehensive, like, led workshop so you know where all the impacts, all the neurological issues, and getting a free lead test kit, I would love for them to be in that space where they can offer actual free lead water testing to your folks, by the way. So I'm just telling you what it does, but also giving you kits so you can see how much it is in people individual household. So I'll drop that email in the chat so you can connect with them. Um, because I think it'll be a fruitful partnership. I just want to give them a shout out and kudos. But to quickly answer, lead, when we talk about the impact, first of all, lead is an organic material that comes from the earth. So it isn't a synthetic chemical, it isn't like human that's made in a lab. So the issue is, of course, it's highly contaminated because it's not a material you should be absorbing or drinking, hence in your water, your paint, even when you go shoot in a lead hole, that's the whole point, it goes into your water. But it causes neurological issues, dementia, Alzheimer's is a pretty big high issue to be exposed to lead for children. We talk about autism, ADD, ADHD, and other actual mental cognitive impairments that we're seeing. Oftentimes, lead can be a direct contributor to creating those actual conditions in our children. It stunts growth, it impairs the brain, it's incredible. Uh, impacts, uh, impacts um, fertility and, and the embryo. We talk about high infant mortality rate for black women. It literally is a, a considerable, considerable um, contaminant that is responsible for those issues. And the reality is, our government knew lead was legal to people before the inception of our government, so to speak. Literally, the word plumber, the word plum, and Latin means lead. So when you talk about historical Rome, Egypt, it's documented that lead has always been lethal for communities to absorb and to receive. So those are just some of the impairments, but it's also a long legacy that, again, if you're being exposed over and over again, it continues to increase the lead amount in your body. If you decrease your exposure, decrease how much lead you're drinking through your water, all these things, your body can't flush it out over time. And the last thing is, you cannot boil lead. You cannot boil lead. When you get these boiling water advisories, people say just boil your water, that boils fecal matter. 
that pulls out germs. That's not going to pull out lead. That makes it work. When you vaporize lead, you now put it in your air and you breathe it in as paper. Okay? But I'll drop her email in the chat and I implore you to connect with her. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. So much. It, again, as I said, this, this has just been so informative um, today. I mean, that and what Mr. Greer, Attorney Greer, has gone over as well. Um, we've got work to do, people, and we need to, to make sure that our community, the communities that we are in, know about these things. Mr. President, um, I was glad you talked about the fraud part. Um, and, you know, I don't know about y'all county, but our county commissioners, they, they were publicizing their meetings, well, on meet night, but you, they was doing it on, not Zoom, but on free conference call. You couldn't understand what they were saying. I'll be at the meeting and couldn't understand it. So that's why I record. And like you say, you have this stuff documented. That's why I come out always document stuff, because if they don't have it on their site, then I'm going to have it, and I won't mind anyway whether they record or not. But in Edgecombe County, I've been videoing the meetings for years before the pandemic came. So they had to get on board and re record their meetings, and I was doing it out of pocket. And um, But like the county commission meeting, um, what I look at is I see how they they create new jobs and all that kind of stuff. And some of that stuff came out of the office, but I know it did. But like you said, we gotta we, we got to be informed. I, I'm on the mailing list. And, and they send me the agenda every month. I make sure I get it out. And then, like I said, I go to the meetings and record it. Uh, they, are, they are still recording it, but it's not Zoom or anything. And, and a lot of times, like I said, you can't understand what they're saying. So that's why I go uh, Rocking Mount City Council. Before they even start doing their meetings, I was doing them. And, you know, it was heavy over there in Rocking Mount. A whole lot of mess was going on. So I had all that stuff documented. But get on the mailing list in your county. And, and so you can get the agenda and all that, so you'll be informed. If you can't make it to the meet, somebody need to go. And then, like I say, if uh, and try to find somebody to record it, because it's best to have your own documentation. Thank you, and, and, and I'm I'm sure I know I know your nickname <laughs> or what they call. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Next on the agenda, I'm going to, as he's already spoken, but I'm going to ask Mr. Mr. Bond if he would present uh, the next presenter. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Our next speaker will be Cyrene uh, Jasmine. I think that's right. If I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry. But he's with Black Votes Matter. And he's here today to let you know uh, what's going on with their organization. Zaneen, it's all on you. All right. So I won't be going at all. Um, I, I apologize for interrupting Secretary Bryant earlier. Of course, on you. Um, uh, so just two things real quick. Um, as you know, there's a lot of things coming down the pipeline from uh, Supreme Court. We did, a, we did get some good news this past Thursday. Um, in regards to Alabama, but there's still some things that we're talking about here in North Carolina. Of course, um, pretty much gerrymandering, gerrymandering is, is, was made legal by our state Supreme Court. And secondly, um, um, vote ID is now in effect. And then number three, um, uh, folks that are were formerly incarcerated still have to go through major barriers to be elected. I mean, not to be elected, but to be able to vote. Um, so we're going to have events this upcoming um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're having a, a tour of Black Voters Matter for the Supreme Justice Court. And so our first event is at 5 o'clock in Dance County. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 2, two thirty in Dance County, Henderson, North Carolina. Um, and then our, our last event is at uh, starting at 5, 5 to 5 or 5 30 in, at the winery, in our Seven Spring Winery in. Uh, North Carolina, North Carolina. So um, I think uh, see if I can attach the flyers in the chat room. Um, but that's uh, pretty much it. We have those. Uh, we have a tour that's taking place in our area, and it's going to the Durham, the Raleigh area, and then the, the third day is going to Southwest. So for, for folks here in DC, 
Um, if we can come out this Monday um, to the either to the Vance County stop or uh, Warren County stop, or come to both if we can. And that's that's all I have right now. I think I've heard a whole lot. I appreciate uh, the information I've learned. Thank you so much, Zayn. Thank you so much. And, and in our presence today, we're so delighted to have uh, Kim Kim Mack and uh, Kim Mack Jones, right? <laughs> Just Kim Mack. Kim Mack. <laughs> Kim Mack. We're delighted to have her here. Who? She's the uh, district manager of First Congressional Congressman Davis's office. So, um, would you come on before us, Ms. Mack? Sure. Okay. Thank you. How y'all doing today? Uh, how did you want to go? Oh, I need to get yeah. them so, so, so they can see you. your face. Congress. 
So uh, we're, we're excited for that. Many of you know that uh, yesterday the president was in the 1st Congressional District. So we were delighted that he was here, he and his wife. Um, and they were also able to make a stop at Rocky Mount at Nash Community College. Uh, it was a closed event, um, so everybody wasn't able to attend. But it was a well-attended event, and uh, they were able to discuss Invest in America and the importance of community colleges to the workforce. So uh, it was it was great to be able to have you know our president here on official business. So uh, if you want to see some additional updates, uh, uh, of course the media has a lot as well as Congressman uh, Davis also has information on his website as well. So I want to uh, share all of that with you. And then um, also want to share that we uh, were getting ready for another upcoming district work period at the end of the month. So um, we'll be sharing information about the activities that we will be doing. Uh, his last district work period was cut short because of the, uh, uh, the debt selling issues and trying to get debt votes going so it was it was cut short but we did have an opportunity to uh, have uh, Congressman Joe Neguse from Colorado he came here to our district uh, and the congressman they were able to have a round table with some veterans uh, in the congressional office so that was a good opportunity that we were able to have and um, be able to meet with people and of course um, the farm field discussions are you know still ongoing um, I was at a agriculture agribusiness meeting last week in Wilson, so if it's not too late for input on that for anybody who may have um, any input on that. So just wanted to share a few you know updates with you regarding what was going on here. Um, also, uh, lastly, want to also share that we had an opportunity uh, to go to the border. So uh, that happened a few a few weeks ago, as well as he's also um, working um, bipartisanly uh, with some legislation around um, the around the border. So um, wanted to let you know that. But he wanted to go and get a firsthand experience to be able to see, you know, what was going on. So uh, it was it was really good to see. It was very eye opening to. Uh, be able to witness firsthand the part we were there. It was, uh, it was a drug bust while we were there. Uh, we were able to see an unaccompanied minor who was three years old who had crossed the border alone. Uh, so it was it was a lot to see. We also visited the same facility where the, the young girl um, had passed away. Uh, you may have seen that in the news. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that's going on down there is, is really real. Um, and of course, um, another reason why it was eye-opening was because we see what's on the news and we hear what was on the news, but to be able to go and, and see it firsthand was really breathtaking. So I was thankful that I had the opportunity to join them on that trip to the border for that visit. So um, that's all really uh, that I have. I just want to let you know we're here for you. You know how to reach me if you need to uh, reach out to me. Um, the office is uh, in Greenville, but of course we're we're out in the district myself and um, regional directors. So um, please reach out to us. I think everybody in this room probably already has my business card already. Um, so, but if you need one, I'll give you one, um, and we're here for you. Anybody have any questions for me? I'm happy to be here with you guys today. So it's nice to put some faces with some names because before I was, I was virtual. So yes. I called them this morning. I said, I think I'll come on down this morning. So I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Okay. I got one question. With the farm bill, mm -hmm. when are the action from the storm? I know you're having all these listening sessions. So when are they implement things from the listening sessions and start working on the farm bill? Do you have an idea? I do not know because I believe that they still have it open. Um, we had, if you attended, there was like a survey and it was one that uh, was on the website and we printed it out and we were able to give back to people. So I know they're still taking uh, suggestions and comments and things right now. So I, I know that they're in discussions, but I don't know when things will, will be here finalizing. Are the surveys still available for? Mm -hmm. They're online. Online? Mm -hmm. 
if you yes, uh, if you give me your email, I'll make sure I can send you a link before I leave, and I'll be here for the duration of the meeting. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack. Had my to start sending out his newsletter. We actually just recently hired a new person on staff that started um, the the day after Memorial Day. So that's one of the things that um, that the press secretary will be working on for us. So we're sending, or of course, sharing updates on social media. But the right. newsletter is forthcoming, so we will be having that soon. Probably the next couple, two to three weeks, we should see the first one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any online? Okay, if no, we do thank you, Ms. Mack. Well, thank we you, thank you. Thank you. That is it with our uh, presenters today. Uh, I do, I do, we do need to take a look at our bylaws. We have revised the bylaws and we want to present them to the body today. Now, uh, I, I call on Mr. Sears, who's, who's the veteran of this group. Now, when it says the reading of the minute, of the Constitution. Do we have to read this? Well, technically, you ought to. Technically, you ought to. You know, you got a very small setting, so obviously it wouldn't be. I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're not very allowed to tell you. But yeah, it won't be read. It ought to be read. Okay. All right. I'm going to read some, and then I'm going to pass it to <laughs> my first vice chair. But you know what? Yeah. I, I, So first vice and, and third vice, do you do you all mind reading some of this? <laughs> okay, okay, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some and I'll give uh, third vice <laughs> Smith some. And yes. <laughs> Hyde, Lenore, Martin, Northampton, 
Pamela Call, Dice Retirement, McCormick, Pitt, Terrell, and Washington County. Article 3 Meeting. Regular meetings and special meetings of the members should be called and held at such place at the point of a search time and the executive committee should authorize. The regular meeting should be held on a date established by the executive committee and appointed, approved by the general body. The meeting of the executive committee may be held in conjunction with but prior to regular meetings. And I think I've picked up this, you know, they show them a video. Why they do somewhere? I don't know. They stay in North Carolina. Special meetings should be called by the majority of the executive committee. Notice of meeting. <clears throat> Written notice of all meetings should be mailed or emailed to each member no less than seven days and no more than 30 days before the date set for search meeting. Notice may, may not be required of due to established meeting time and places as agreed by the general body. All notices of any special meeting should state the purpose of that meeting. The recording of the county leadership members. The roster of the organization should include a list of five district representative name and address and provided by the members to the secretary. A quorum. A quorum of all meetings of the meet, all meetings of the minutes, well, excuse me, a quorum of all meetings of the members should consist of an actual president, a one third of the county members established or to vote. If less than a quorum of present is present, the majority of the vote members present at the adjourned the meeting without further notice. Voting member represent at the duly organized meeting may pretend to transact business unless the meeting is adjourned. Even if withdrawal of this part, departure of members result in the presence of less than a quorum. Voting. <clears throat> as staff and otherwise stated, all matter brought to the vote at a meeting should be decided by a simple majority of the county present and voted, providing that the quorum is present. The residing office should have the same voting statute as other members. Proxy, there, there should be no voting by proxy at meeting of any members. Member, membership will be limited to those persons who support and participate in the goals, objectives, and ideas of the organization. County membership will be equal, will be achieved by paying an assessment of $100 annually. A full paid county will be assessed with one vote and matter before the body. A $10 membership fee is, a, is available to persons who the county cannot pay the $100 hundred dollar assessment fee. Individual members will be entitled to a one-tenth of the vote on matters that come before the body. The county and the individual assessment fee should be paid by April 1st of each year. Article 4, Officers. The officer of the Eastern North Carolina City Group should consist of a president, three vice president, a secretary, assistant secretary, a treasurer, and other officer as the executive committee may elect from time to time. Section two, an election of term, the office of the civic group should be elected by a general membership. Each county should have one vote. Search elections should be held in September of our number years. The term of each office should be two years. Each officer should be eligible to hold office for two consecutive terms. After that, office cannot serve until the completion of one year uh, vacancy. The president, the president, the president should be the chief executive officer of the civic group. The president should 
supervise and control the management of the civic group in accordance with the bylaws. The president should, rep should uh, represent a meet, to reside at meetings of members and act as the chairman of the executive committee. The president should sign with other officers any instruction, instruments on behalf of the civic group and may be required or permitted by law. In general, the president should perform all duties that are in, that in, included to the office or incited to the office and other duties as defined by the executive committee. Between meeting of the general body, the president is authorized to execute general executive authority on behalf of the Eastern North Carolina City Group. Subject to ratification by the executive committee and on the general body, the president is to perform such other functions and execute and exercise such duty as may be voted from time to time by the general body or the executive committee. The president is authorized to appoint committee chairman subject to the approval of the general body or the executive committee. The vice president, in the absence of the president or in the event of death, inability, or refusal to act, the vice president in order of their normal ranking unless otherwise determined by the executive committee to perform the duties of the president. When it's so acting, the vice president should have all the power of and be subject to all the restrictions of the president. Any vice president should perform other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee. Secretary. The secretary should be kept, should keep accurate records of the meeting and process of all meetings. The secretary should maintain a list of all standing committees and all certain members of the committee and mission statement that is in, uh, in charge of the committee. The secretary should give notice of all meetings as required by the bylaws. The secretary should turn over all records and other proceedings to the assistant secretary upon resignation, the ability, inability, or the refusal to act, and upon any other vacancy. The secretary will uh, acknowledge other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee. Continuing on, good morning, everyone. Section 6. Assistant Secretary, <clears throat> in the absence of the Secretary, <clears throat> or in the event of death, inability or refusal to act, the Assistant Secretary will perform all of the duties of the Secretary. When so acting, the Assistant Secretary shall have all the power of and be subject to all restrictions of the Secretary. The Assistant Secretary shall perform other duties as assigned by the President and Executive Committee. Section 7, the Treasurer. The treasurer shall have custody of all funds and securities belonging to the uh, ENCCG, which is the city group, and shall receive deposits and disperse the same under the direction of the executive committee. The treasurer shall keep full and accurate accounts of the finances of the city group. The treasurer will provide reports to the city group every two months. The financial records will be available for review by the executive committee upon request. The Treasury will provide an annual report and statement of financial status to the city group. The Treasury will accomplish other duties as assigned by the President and the Executive Committee upon the approval of the general body. Article 5, Committees. Section 1, Executive Committee. The Executive Committee shall have general control of the affairs and programs of the city group, subject to the authority of the general body and the provision of these approved bylaws. The executive committee shall render a report containing the reports of all standing and special committees at the regular meeting of the general body. The executive committee shall act as directed by the general body. The executive committee shall be empowered to act in the absence of the general body. The executive committee shall report all actions taken to the body at the next regular meeting or special call meetings as it occurs. The executive committee shall be composed of the duly elected officers of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. 
Section 2, Standing Committees. There shall be five standing committees of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. One, the Committee on Bylaws, Elections, Nominations, and Operating Procedures. This committee is charged with the duties and responsibility of reporting on all changes by the bylaws and any such amendments to the general body with such sufficient notice given no less than 30 days prior to changes in the bylaws. Likewise, the committee is charged with giving notice of any changes in the operating procedure of the general body. The committee is also charged with creating rules and regulations of all nominations of persons for the various office, offices of the Eastern City Group. During odd number years, this committee is charged with creating a state a slate of officers for elections at least 90 days prior to the September election date as set in other provisions of these bylaws. This committee shall have other such duties as deemed necessary by the general body. Two, the Committee on Economic Development. The Committee on Economic Development shall implement local efforts and support programs to preserve and expand economic empowerment among the black and brown minority citizens of Eastern North Carolina. The committee shall engage in other duties, functions, and responsibilities as necessary to implement economic development to its constituents. Three, the committee in finance. The committee shall plan and conduct fundraising activities, budgets, and financial operation of the general body. The committee shall have such other duties, functions, and responsibilities as approved by the general body. Four, the committee on political action. The committee on political action is charged with creating methods to increase participation of black and brown minority citizens in the electoral process and in the governmental operations at the local, state, and national level. Five, the Committee in Social Welfare. This committee shall implement the social action and social welfare policies and procedures of the general body. The committee shall have other duties and responsibilities as approved by the general body. Section three, ad hoc committee. Ad hoc committees shall be appointed to research, review, and report on matters of concerns to the city group. The chairman of the ad hoc committee shall be appointed by and served at the pleasure of the president. Article 6, Regional Organization, Section 1. Regions of the city group. The counties of the city group are divided into the following regions. Northwest region five counties, Bertie, Halifax, Hertford, Martin, Northampton. Northeast region, six counties, Camden, Tawan, Carita, Gates, Pascatane, Perquimans. Central East region, four counties, Dare, Hyatt, Terrell, Washington. Central West region, Four counties, Beaufort, Edgecombe, Green, Pitt. Southern region, four counties, Cataract, Craven, the North, Pamlico. The bylaws may be amended by a two-third vote of the general body. All proposed amendments to the general body shall be presented at least 30 days prior to the duly called meeting and or a regular meeting provided. Therefore, and proper prior notice is given. With that being said, I present to you Eastern North Carolina City Group bylaw approval. Um, and we'll have a date upon it. Upon a motion made by the chair of the bylaw committee, the Eastern North Carolina City Group duly adapt, adopt and approve these bylaws. On whatever date you do, do decide to do that, the year of 2023, and in a duly organized meeting held in where it is actually held, what county? Okay? Date, and this will be dated and signed by the president and the secretary. And I'll show it. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, 
online, but the form will look like this. And, from, and a copy of the bond will be sent out to all the member um, emails, so you'll have a chance to look over and read it by the next time we have our next week. That concludes the reading of the first uh, of the bylaw first reading. Thank you for attending and listening. And, and I'm so glad that uh, I got this set up here so that those online, everyone can see that these are the new uh, vice, first vice. Uh, Mr. Matthews isn't here, he was second vice, and Ms. Smith is the third vice president of the organization. So I do thank you all for that. Thank you so much. So according to, to the, what was just the present bylaws that we're under, um, our next meeting will be a reading and then we will be moving for approval of that. So I'm going to ask Betty to email this draft bylaws so that everyone can sit home and read it with, by themselves. Uh, also, also, I do ask, there, there's some people online that uh, came on after roll call, so we would ask that you would introduce yourselves, and if you don't mind, if you're new to the civic group, if you would drop your email in the chat so that we can add you to the email list. Betty, I can't see. I'm too, we're too far away to see. So, repeat the passion. Repeat your name. Betty Smith. 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 Betty I can hear you, Miss Ben. She's muted uh, now. I think the president said to uh, drop it in the chat. Okay. And, and the next thing is to get us in compliance with the present bylaw. Uh, we had to go on and try to get these committees. So the Committee on Bylaws, Elections, Nominating, and Operating Procedures. Uh, I, 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 we named Mr. Sears as, was it Mr. Sears or Mr. Matthews? The, to chair the Committee on Bylaws, Elections, and Nominating. That's Mr. Sears on nominating. On the nominee. Okay. So if it is anyone who would want to volunteer to be members of that committee, I think if we. Three people is enough. I think. So if it's any people that are interested in getting on the committee or on bylaws, please send an email to Betty. Or you can send an email to me that you're interested. My email address is Stokes, S-T-O-K-E-S, capital, K-A-P-P-A, -A 81, at gmail.com. So Stokes, capital, at email.com. Betty, what's your email address? I'm putting it in chat. Okay. You can email um, the group E- NCCG1 at gmail.com. Yeah, that's where you send the email. Don't worry about sending it to my address. Can you put your. The next committee. Why don't we put both uh, emails? What is your name? Stokes Capital, K A P P A 81, at Gmail. I was going to tell you what. <laughs> Just so people can have it. A 
81? Yes. Yeah. The Committee on Economic Development, the chair of that is Mr. Matthews, Mo Matthews. Yeah. So we need two other people to serve on that committee. The Committee in Finance, Brother Barnes is the chair of the Finance Committee. And you heard Ms. Smith read what those, the responsibility of that committee is. The Committee on Political Action, uh, Mr. Sears. Uh, it's Mr. Smith. Oh, Mr. Smith is the chair. Mm -hmm. And um, what's his name? Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy and uh, Mr. Sears. That's the committee on political action. So I need to meet. I was going to be a part of that, and I was going to be the chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well. Well, you and Jeremy was co-chair. Okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, y'all were co-chair. Yes. And Mr. Sears, we should remember. Right, so, so I know that committee won't go wrong. <laughs> uh, the committee um, the committee in social welfare, we have no one on there. So if there's anyone that's interested, please let us know. Now after we approve the new bylaws, we're going to need five district representatives. That will be chairing uh, the Northwest Northwest region, the Northeast region, the Central East region, the Central West region, and the Southern region. So, so what, what those folks will do is help organize those counties that will be listed under their region and we, we got to expand with, with the information that you heard today. If we don't get this information out, we are failing our people. And, and this group, this, this is what has always been the purpose of the civic group, is to, to have communication going with these 23 counties. So hopefully, uh, after we get these new bylaws, and get those regional directors set up that we will begin to see an expansion and, and bringing back this organization to what it used to be. Is there anything else to come before the body today? If there's nothing else. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, I had a lot going on in my calendar this morning, but I look forward to attend this meeting because the information like we received today. Yeah. So I look forward, I, for me, this is the uh, most important organization in North Carolina for me right now, you know, because we get so much information and, and it covers so many different counties. So I appreciate you. Okay, our announcements before we adjourn. Uh, on August the 19th at 2 p.m., the time has been changed, 2 p.m., we're going to have an appreciation banquet for Mr. James Sears, who has been a rock in this organization for, for I know, 20 years, and probably more than, longer than that. Mrs. Derrick Murrow, who was our treasurer, and Mrs. May McGee, who was our recording secretary our assistant secretary. So we're going to have that. That is going to be at the WDC Chance Building in Robertsonville, August the 19th at 2 p.m. Our next meeting will be on uh, next month. Now, I do need you all to look at your calendars. The second Saturday in July is August the 8th. That's right around July 4th. Excuse me. Oh, July. 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 The second. I, I don't want us to skip 
Dexter. 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 Dexter.
Unless I cook, then they'll want to come. We have hosted in the years past. It was good. And, uh, but then, you know, the civic group was real active. And uh, we never had quite a bit of participation. And, you know, we didn't travel from one end of the district to the other to uh, meetings. And, you know, but then because of COVID, we haven't met in a, a long while. So I think right now we just need to focus on getting it back up and running good and doing well, you know. And I have one question on the battle house, if I may. Are they an uh, update on their complete rewrite? An update. Okay. Not not a complete rewrite. Okay. Right. Multiple yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like like adding the five regional directors. That's new. Okay. That won't get political today. <laughs> you see, all the regional was already named, but what had happened, right. I can't remember the, the the executive committee themselves were in charge. Like Mr. Fred had asked Mr. Matthew to take one part, he decided yeah. somebody else. But that was all on the executive committee and the board members, and that was kind of hard for them to do everything they had to do. So we felt like if we get a person from that district to work with those counties, then we get better participated. And then we try to go out there and reach them and we know where they are. That's the reason we added that. I think that was one of the only thing that we added was those five representatives. Okay. Right. But it just wasn't, we didn't rewrite it, we just said, okay, we need somebody to represent, to be responsible for those positions. And here, here's something to supplement what you said, what you suggested is that that region will host the meeting here. So it will be, uh, for instance, Edgecombe, Pitt, whatever, we're in the, that region, they, those four counties would host the meeting here. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that's, that's food for thought. Right? That's very good. All right, if there's nothing else to come before the, the body, Except the motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, thank you all so much. July the 18th. July. July 15th.